Hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. I know we are. It is our three-year anniversary. Happy three years, anniversary, baby. Jay. Happy anniversary, Louis. What is it? Paper this year? Diamond gold paper. I have to look it up every uh, yeah, year. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what, how that applies to podcasting and UFO investigative work. But yeah, you might be onto something. Yeah, it's probably the probably like a gray skin is the three years. Oh so. yeah, 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 yeah. Or Very pro. fitting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when we did our second year, we had George Knapp. We hit our hundredth anniversary or hundredth episode. We had Jacques Vallée. It just works out every time. It's a big day for us. We have a massive guest, and today we've got John Ramirez. Uh, sadly, this is John Ramirez's second last interview. He's only doing one after this. And then by his own declaration, he's stepping back until disclosure happens. So I'm super pumped up just to know that it's going to happen. And it's not just Stephen Bassett being the only one out there screaming that it's coming in months, not years. Yeah. So, uh, Jay, I know you want, we also wanted to poll our audience. I think you went with Twitter this time. Yeah, we got a lot of uh, a lot of comments and people had questions on Twitter. It lit up like a Christmas tree when they knew that John was coming on because he said so many things under the podcast that we've all been paying attention to, but he hasn't elaborated on. So we got a few uh, uh, selected uh, great questions from our, our listeners. For sure. And maybe we can fill in some of those gaps and uh, tie up some loose ends. We did it with Gary Nolan, right? You get a vague answer and you ask again, ask again. Next thing you know, we're confirming that there's... Uh, Meta materials and bits and pieces of UFO craft that the government have. So good cop, good cop. <laughs> exactly. We're going to yeah. do it in our usual style. We will ask. And if it is not sufficient, we will ask again until we get the answer. John is a very amicable guy. I don't think we're going to have to literally yank it like teeth out of his head. But if we need to yank teeth out of the head, we're doing it today because it's our third year anniversary. I'm excited, Jay. I threw my back out this morning, so I apologize. Yes, you for did. This. Yeah. In fact, I threw my back out about 30 minutes ago. I had to get my wife help me. Uh, shower and and get dressed not a very proud moment i'm not gonna lie but uh i'm here i wouldn't miss this show for the world we've done shows with covid you were sick a few weeks ago i can't walk but this is what this is what commitment looks like mm, everybody mm, absolutely so, yeah welcome yeah. to it third year anniversary <laughs> we'll be right back with mr john ramirez right here on uap studies podcast Welcome back to another very special episode of UAP Studies Podcast. It is our third year anniversary, as we mentioned in the intro, and uh, I couldn't think of a greater guest to have uh, with us today. I think uh, our first year was George, or second year was George Knapp. Then we hit 100 episodes. We had Jacques Vallée. Yeah. Now we got the man himself, John Ramirez. Uh, this is his second last interview before stepping out of the limelight a little bit. So we're very uh, uh, proud and uh, thankful that he was able to join us today. And for those who don't know who John Ramirez is, he served in the CIA from 1984 uh, to 2009 uh, in the Directorate of Science and Technology, also the Directorate of Intelligence and the ODNI National Counter Proliferation Center. I said that without screwing it up. It's a mouthful, Louis. <laughs> John uh, specializes in signals intelligence, ballistic missile defense, weapon system radar, technical collection operations. Uh, he's a former chief of the Electronic Intelligence Analysis Branch, and he's also a member of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers and the Central Intelligence Retirees Association. So now that I nailed that, welcome to the show, John Ramirez. <laughs> well, Louis and Jason, thank you very much for having me. I'm kind of honored to be on your uh, show for this uh, August anniversary um, and uh, following in the footsteps of uh, my colleague, uh, Jim Semivan. So I'm very, very flattered. Absolutely, and I was going to yeah. say, you know, why have me on everything he said, you know, <laughs> refer to Jim, pay yeah. attention to him. Ditto. Yeah. See, he, yeah. Yeah. I, I was a GS 15. Um, and that's uh, the equivalent uh, army rank is Colonel, a bird Colonel wearing an Eagle. Oh, nice. um, but Jim was uh, the equivalent of a general in the CIA. So he was a much higher position. Did not know uh, that much more accesses. Uh, he, he and I both earned the career intelligence medal. I, Usually, admit that in my bios. Uh, so, but yeah, he he's well connected, um, better more so than I I have been. But I worked uh, more in the uh, director of intelligence, the analytical side, and of course, uh, science and technology. Uh, obvious what that was all about. So I worked from the technical side and the analysis side. Jim worked on the operation side, like he was the actual spy 
who was trained how to recruit foreigners to work for the United States government. So he has those skills, the kind of skills that you see in the movies. Uh, wow. We're the we're the guy. Uh, we're we're the guys on my side of the CIA. We're the guys that squirt away underneath the basement, uh, wearing the headphones like I am now, listening and tuning into like signals. You know? Yeah. So that's what I did. More technical side. Awesome. He's like Liam Neeson. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You can say yeah. that. Yeah, he's more of the Jason uh, Bjorn kind of guy. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So usually we uh, we go through and we explain, you know, or we ask the guest, tell us, you know, what got you into the field and all yeah. that. You've done quite a few shows, so your bio is out there. We yeah. want to make the best use of our time with you today. So we've also polled our audience. I think we used Twitter this time to do a poll. Mm -hmm. Some people submitted questions. So Jason's got some questions from our viewers sure. that we're going to intermingle throughout the episode. Uh, and we'll just get right to it here. So I understand you are an experiencer as well. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your personal experiences that you've had. Yes, um, I, I've been experiencer since um, childhood, and I think um, four years old was the first time where I, I looked through a telescope, and through that telescope, I felt like that um, I didn't belong in the planet. This is a strange feeling that I belonged out there amongst the stars I was looking at, uh, the moon and the nearby planets. Um, the owner of the telescope was uh, my parents' landlord. And uh, he was an amateur astronomer in Japan. And so he brought his telescope and that got me interested in space at a very young age. And so I felt like, yeah, you know, I want to be out in space because that's where I belong. And I don't know how I ended up on this planet, you know, and, <laughs> you know, it's been like that ever since where um, when I was five years old, living with my aunt and uncle in uh, the state of Virginia, um, that I actually saw my first craft and it was uh, not a blimp or dirigible or nothing like that um it had no means of propulsion it didn't have the telltale gondola underneath with propellers it, nothing like that it was just the shape of a of a blimp like a giant tic tac if you will and it rose above the forest line uh to the right of where we we're playing in front of um the place i was staying at and it was a ch children's playground across the street and i pointed to this object and none of my cousins or my playmates saw it. They didn't know what I was pointing to. And I saw it plain as day, lifting out of the, uh, above the forest line and going gently outward and disappearing. So that was like the second experience I had. And shortly thereafter, um, when my mother joined us from Japan, she stayed in Japan uh, to learn English. And so she joined my father and my sister and, and, uh, and me in Virginia. And um, at that time, I started having these uh, occurrences of remembering of um, being taken to a house where I was examined um, by a woman leading me to the house, not my mother, and a doctor and a nurse there dressed up very much like we, we would call uh, Victorian era garb with Victorian looking uh, instruments, um, an office. Excuse me, I need, I need to cough. I'm, I'm No, go ahead. Yeah, by all means. It's allergy season. Yeah, I know. It's it's, uh, it's it's plaguing us here in Arizona, of all places. But anyway, to long story short, you know, that was another experience I had of being examined by this doctor and this nurse. Um, recently, I recalled, and I should have known before, that I remember an inoculation of some sort being given to me mm -hmm. in my arm. And so these memories happen more than once. That was like th at least... Three, I remember two going into this examining room on the first floor and one time going to the examining room on the second floor. Now, you know, you um, look into the UFO literature, the ufology literature, and there's this thing called, you know, cover memories, that this could have been a cover memory, um, that you may have been taken aboard a craft and you may have been examined, but this is the memory they gave you so that you could handle it. Uh, that could be true. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that something like that occurred to the point where I asked my mother when I was still very young, uh, as these uh, occurrences would happen, about examining, being examined by a doctor. Did I go to the doctor's office, mom? And she says, no, nothing like that ever happened. And so this is just a few of the examples that I've had in other uh, podcasts. I've mentioned them in greater, greater detail, but those were the beginning ones that I've had. 
And uh, I wanted to be judicious of your time, so I'd be happy to entertain more questions. Well, the uh, well, it's interesting that you've had these occurrences. Uh, when you recall them, were they at nighttime or, or daytime? Like, was this while you were fully awake? Well, it seemed like I was fully awake when I had them, which is why um, I was compelled to ask my mother about them. It wasn't like I had a dream, and then I asked my mother about the dream. Um, it felt like it really did happen to me, which is why, you know, I wanted to know, did it happen? Right. Uh, apparently, my mother said nothing like that happened, and yet I have a conscious memory of something like that occurring. And there was three entities or three people in the room with you? Uh, the woman who led me to this house um, stayed outside and picked me up after the examining examination was over and led me out of the house. Interesting. Um, so... The examination actually occurred in the room with the doctor and a nurse. So two people examined me and the woman who led me to the examining room stayed outside. Interesting. Yeah. Were there any, these were like human looking people? Yeah, very not? much human. Oh, absolutely. Really? Mm -hmm. So what do you make of that? Were they hybrids? Was this on this I don't know, planet? Because, you know, a cover memory, they can appear to be anything they want you That's to true. remember. Yeah. And so I, I can't say that they were hybrids. They were ETs of, of the gray type or any of the other uh, uh, typical uh, ETs that people have seen. Yeah. I, I can't say that. It's just that they presented themselves to me as human, as human as uh, you and I uh, are. So, yeah. yeah. Even and on that note, what what do you make of all the different species that people have reported? I mean, even the former Canadian defense minister, Paul Hellyer, yeah. he estimated there was over 83 species. That's crazy. Like, not just aliens exist. There's dozens and dozens of them. I mean, we got reptilians, Nordics, greys, avian blues, tall greys, short greys. What do you make right. of all the... Yes, um, uh, people call it uh, uh, Mr. Hellyer and others, uh, such as the Israeli um, equivalent of the director of NRO, call them a federation. And I've heard a better term, um, uh, commonwealth. And as Canadians, your Canadian audience knows that uh, you're part of the uh, uh, historic British Commonwealth because your uh, head of state is King Charles III, but your head of government is uh, Mr. Trudeau. And so in that sense, it's more of a commonwealth. It's independent countries or independent races uh, joined together for a common purpose. And they themselves may have their own agendas. They may then regulate themselves independently of the others with their own agendas. And so I think that's what uh, Mr. Hellyer was referring to is more of a commonwealth than a, than a federation. Um, as far as those who interact with us, um, I've heard, and I can't attribute how I heard them, unfortunately, but I heard that there's only a limited number of them actually interfacing with humans that are allowed to interface with humans and like half a dozen. And we tend to see these half dozen all the time. And it's usually the uh, typical reptilian looking pers uh, person. And I call them people because it's easier to think of them as people, really, seriously, instead of like this creature from another place, even though they might be creatures from another place. I call them people. Um, they're like reptilian looking people. They're like mantis looking people or insectoid people. Uh, they, tend, they tend to be uh, at least a couple of types of grays, one taller than the other. And then there is the Nordic, a more human looking um as well and on the reptilian side apparently there is a race that has been associated with the the moon the moon our moon on the far side of the moon where remote viewers who've removed re, remote view the far side of the moon were told explicitly by them never to come back do not do this and that was reported back to the u.s government because these were government remote viewers and that's in the literature now as well and uh so I would say maybe there's a half a dozen interfacing with us, interacting with us. Oh, I forgot one more, the blue being. There's a being that has a kind of a blue skin. And so these might be the folks who are uh, interfacing with us and could be representing this commonwealth of other beings that are out there as well. We've explored the like the possibilities because there's a lot of theories out there about what these entities could be. I mean, Michael Paul Masters says they could be uh, ultra tempestrial, meaning they they might be us from the yeah. future. They might be interdimensional, yeah. 
as well, yeah. right? They, they occupy a dimension we can't see. Uh, they could be extraterrestrial or it could be a collective of all of them. There could be so much different variety and complexities to each one of these situations that that's what makes it difficult. That even if we come out with disclosure and people are aware, we don't understand the full picture because there's just so much that we're not at that stage in our evolution to be able to comprehend properly. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because it's more a reaction of how we are going to interact now socially and globally uh, once we all admit that we have this issue in common. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, those are hypotheses that have been uh, out there for a while. Um, uh, if you talk to Mr. Sunnyvan, uh, which you did, um, he adheres uh, to what he calls the ultra terrestrial hypotheses and the interdimensional hypotheses <clears throat> and along with that interdimensional hypotheses come the uh extra tempestrial hypotheses as well it's blended into it um i i just concluded a week-long um uh conference uh hosted by a physicist associated with cia that many people don't know but people should know his name is dr jack Serfati, and if you listen to his story in 1953, when he was a teenager, he says that he got a phone call when he was a kid uh, living in Brooklyn, New York, where he was contacted by a self-identified AI from the future who talked to him. And rece he received downloads. And that the ultimate message was that you're not going to be able to use this information right now, but in your future, you will. And strange enough, in his future, he was. Uh, he was contacted by CIA to work on these special projects related to this entire topic. And so he has a lot of knowledge. And so he is a strong proponent of um, the AI from the future. And um, the more I think about it, I think we can't discount that because people are wondering, you know, why are they back here? Are they trying to warn us of, of something that's occurring right now? And you know what's occurring right now? is humanity's nascent exploration of AI and where that could lead, good or bad. And if they're back from the future, let's say, they could be here to warn us that what we're doing with AI, the way we're going about it, uh, will have a very bad outcome or not very positive outcomes. And they're here to help us steer what we should be doing with AI, because I think it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's the next level of, of technology, more so than the nuclear age or any of the other ages, the industrial age. The AI age is an extension of what we would call the computer information technology age. It's the ultimate expression because now we're dealing with um, a non-organic entity, AI, taking on organic-like behaviors and properties. And gosh, the last thing I want is a Terminator <laughs> coming back to us, <laughs> right? So, I mean, of course, this is all speculation, but um, uh, it, I think it has a lot of traction. And um, and again, I'm sorry for your audience. I can't, I cannot uh, go back and uh, accredit what I know, but um, I would not discount the uh, time travelers from the future hypothesis at all. I would I would hold that somewhat lightly, but I would not discount it at all uh, because I'm hearing more and more that this could be the answer to what's going on. And in this conference, uh, Dr. Safadi laid out beautifully and in what I call layman's terms, uh, much to the disappointment of the other PhD physicists there who wanted to see math equations, uh, he laid out this case for this AI from the future, how the tech tac and other such vehicles may have a time component a time aspect to its technology and that its propulsion system and consciousness melded together now whenever you say consciousness in front of a physicist theoretical or applied they're going to completely dismiss you this yeah. consciousness oh get out of here you're you're like you're a looney tune you know get out of here um but he actually believes that there is a consciousness aspect and I can say that he's on the right track, that the consciousness aspect of this phenomenon is something that the government became very interested in and has always been interested in. Um, going back to maybe perhaps Roswell, because if you read the literature and if you believe the literature, 
apparently there was some telepathic communication between one of the beings who survived and the humans. Some telepathy occurred. And so if you look at the Roswell story and the aftermath of the Roswell story, um, that becomes part of that narrative. And was that true? Well, so it happens in 1947, keeping in mind July 47 is Roswell. And a few weeks later, um, CIA was authorized to be created and was created on September 18, 47. But later that year, uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence and the CIA got together and started something called Project Chatter. Chatter. Uh, do, exploring uh, the use of uh, actually uh, psychedelics in order to expand consciousness. Um, that's one of the program goals. And that led to what we now know as MK Ultra. And it's not about so much mind control as behavior modification. And the purpose of uh, MK Ultra was to modify the behavior of a foreign national who's highly placed in the government to convince that person that it's a good thing to be a traitor to his or her country to provide us with information. That was the ultimate goal of MK Ultra. Um, and so um, leading uh, off of that is remote viewing, which is all about communication, you know, like telepathic communication, or I guess um, you would say projecting uh, one's consciousness to a distant place in order to discern what might be at that distant place. And it was part of uh, a spy tradecraft. Yeah. So all that could add up together for that compelling story that, you know, there's something to do with um, this higher consciousness aspect of the phenomenon. Uh, more so and uh, beyond just the cool propulsion system that makes it fly. Uh, conscious aspect plus a time travel as a source of that phenomenon coming back, all melded together. And so that combines already several conspiracy theories, several things that are considered conspiracy theories. And I'm hoping as um, we go toward an era of disclosure, which uh, I can say is uh, more truth than fiction, and I just refer to uh, Dr. Gary Nolan's talk uh, he gave in New York City uh, just recently. Um, he pretty much laid out what the government could say, let's put it that way, in the first round of disclosure, which in itself is explosive. <laughs> but, you know, that all of this other, all these other aspects may may come, come forward uh, from that point. You mentioned your colleague, Jack Serfati, and also some of your other friends and colleagues like Jacques Vallée, Gary Nolan, Jim Semivan, all have had experiences, all are somehow enlightened as a result. So do you think that those people were chosen, maybe based on what they knew they were going to become in the future? Or, you know, they they have a um, an audience or they have the ear of the people. Therefore, that's a good person for somebody to try to, you know, interface with. Do you think there's any connection with some of the bigger name people in our our topic, also having experiences. Um, it's interesting that um, members of the uh, defense and civilian intelligence communities uh, seem to have experiences. And whether that's by choice, uh, in, instead of, you know, by choice, I mean, because they were in CIA, because they made a conscious decision to seek CIA career, that these experiences happen, or it was the experience that led them to CIA. In my case, it was my experiences that got me interested in CIA, that this was one of, one of my downloads. You ought to work for CIA. Um, so I, I, that's up to them to, to describe. I, I would preface this that um, other than Jim Simivan, none of these folks are, are I consider colleagues. I never worked with them directly. I've had uh, conversations with Mr. Simivan. Um, but with others, uh, it's more ancillary. Uh, I know them through cutouts too. I never spoke with Dr. Nolan directly or these other individuals, Jack, Dr. Valet, I did meet at a conference, uh, Paulo Harris's Star Wars USA conference in 2021. So right. I got the chance to uh, to meet and greet with him. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say, you know, it, there seems to be uh, a correlation, I'll, I'll put it that way, between those in intelligence community working this and these folks being experiencers, but they're kind of hesitant to say so. And so very few of them have come forward. Uh, but maybe after disclosure, they'll be a little more uh, freer to talk about their experiences. And there'll be the stigma of disclosure is not just to inform us who are UFO enthusiasts uh, about this topic, but 
you know, how many of us are there? Are there like a million, <laughs> maybe two million, but there are 8 billion people on the planet. Yeah. And the purpose is to reach out to those 8 billion people who don't even give this topic a second thought. Right. Uh, but we do. I mean, we, you know, we, we love this topic. It's we're enthusiastic for this topic. We don't need to be convinced. It's the others that we need to uh, reach out to. And I think that's the purpose of disclosures, to bring everyone on board. Uh, and then furthermore, to allow governments like yours in Canada, uh, the UK, the other five ICE partners of ours, Australia and New Zealand, uh, I believe they're sitting on a lot of information. And uh, Mr. Hellyer, the late uh, Mr. Hellyer, would not have said what he said unless he knew that he could back it up, but he wasn't able to reveal any information to back up his claims. Um, right. And I think all of that information is sitting there might come forward, but Canada, UK, New Zealand, and Australia are waiting for the US to make that first step forward. And then I am hoping to see a floodgates, the floodgates open for more information to come out, removing the stigma from uh, everyone not just those who work in government, but the civilian population in general who are not able to uh, talk about this topic with their family, with their friends, and definitely not coworkers for fear of losing their job. And so once we remove that stigma, um, I think uh, the number of experiencers will be far greater than what we think. Well, in the 1990s, there was a Roper poll that was taken and they were saying that one, well, the, the, the final results were that one out of 50 people have been abducted or had some sort of abduction experience. That mm -hmm. was in the 1990s when it was still not okay to talk about this. Right. You know what I mean? When everybody yeah. kept quiet, the government didn't partake in that Roper poll. So we had no buddy on the inside, like CIA members like yourself yeah. or the, the, the defense department coming out, they wouldn't say anything back then. My guess is there's a lot more than one percent that yes. out of you yeah. know That's or one out of fifty. You know, globally, you mentioned yeah. eight billion people. How many people is that globally yeah. that are experiencing this? Well, right, fifty of that. If you can do the math real quick, and that's uh, that's quite a number of uh, people. Um, and no discrimination like it doesn't yeah. matter your creed, your race, your sexuality, mm -hmm. where you're from, what you do for a living, who you are, what you're going through in your life. Mm -hmm specific people are somehow selected for this and it's crazy yeah. to think that that many people are all mentally ill right because i mentioned Absolutely. this before it's either it's a mental illness that is globally rampant right now or it's actually happening they, there's yeah. no middle ground here right absolutely it's it's it seems like um that uh well you it's hard to discount. I'm surprised that people discount it as much as they do. Right. Uh, because, you know, um, in the United States, <clears throat> you can convict someone from eyewitness testimony. Yep. I witnessed this person do this. And uh, eyewitness testimony can convict someone and put them in jail. But in this topic, you have to prove it. You, you have to show um, more than just eyewitness testimony or even when we have evidence, people discount it. Yeah, you know, there's evidence of this, uh, and people discount it because uh, their belief system gets in the way. But I would say this: that you know, if 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 one is a adherent of a belief system, and I'll just pick Christianity because that's the tradition I grew up in, uh, Catholic. And so, a person uh, believes uh, that I believe in in one God, and I believe that Jesus Christ was His Son. No one comes out and disparages them. No one comes out to attack them. No one. They said, oh, okay, I, I respect that belief. Yet when you say, I believe in, in, in this phenomenon, I believe that there are non-humans um, across this universe and that some of them are visiting us, and then you get attacked immediately. Why is that? Why is one belief system accepted and, and another isn't? So I just throw that out there. I, I'm not a philosopher in any way. I can't answer it but you're right um it's, it seems like you know it there's no middle ground you know it and can that this many people experience something and all be delusional yeah same detail too like a yes. lot of them have repeating details description of these entities or how they they say they fly the craft 
That's interesting. We're all wondering what these things are flying around at night. It might be somebody that's just taken up for a test drive. Like, it's crazy. But, uh, yeah, you're right. There's no, um, we don't believe it. When I first got involved with MUFON and the podcast started, I mean, I was a nobody. I had three people that listened to us. This is before Louis came on and the, the, the show picked up. And, uh, you know, I was struggling, but I wanted to be an investigator. And when the guys at work were laughing about it with some of their uh, customers, the customers would approach me afterwards and go, hey, uh, this happened to me. And they would tell me yeah. shit that happened to them. And so they wouldn't admit it in front of the other guys. But to yeah. me, they'd be like, hey, when I was, you know, one guy creeped me out so much. He was an older gentleman and everything was going fine. I'm doing this transaction. I forgot what I was doing. And he leaned in and he looked at me right in the eye. He said, I saw them once, you know, mm -hmm. dude, the hair on my arms went up. I had not mentioned to him at all that I was into UFOs. My coworkers hadn't mentioned anything. Mm -hmm. He just knew automatically that I was into it. Right. It's, it's crazy. The amount of people out there that have had these experiences that are just keeping it quiet. Right. right? And right. I think that's what disclosure is going to do. Like you mentioned, bring people to say, you know what? I've seen it too. Right. Mm -hmm. I keep joking. It's like a me too movement of UFOs, you know, like hashtag <laughs> yeah. me too UFOs, but that's what's happening. It's, and it's people like yourself, sir, that have served in their country, you know, their country, regardless of what country you're in, if you've served your military or the government and you've had experiences that validates what your citizens are going through as well. Right. And to me, it seems like this issue is bigger than any government or military that we have on this planet. It's about humanity and what we're all going through, what we're all experiencing. So that's why disclosure is so weird because we're just waiting for the government to just validate what we already know is going on and that something's not right, right? And I think to your, you know, to your credit, like saying that uh, disclosure is, is coming, we just got to hang in there. I'm looking forward to how much of it is going to be validated and how much of it is real. Right. And I can say this much. Um, uh, I think what you will be hearing um, will have been uh, not only the people coming forward, uh, but also the information they will be sharing. The people have been vetted and the information has been validated. And how do we do that? Because, you know, you have UFO Twitter and people making claims uh, on social media, so forth and so on. How do you how do you sort that out? It's very difficult right now. Uh, but the people coming forward, um, they have served in the positions with the clearances necessary to know the information they're sharing. And so there are ways to do that. And because you know, if I provided my name, social security number, place, and date of birth into a database called Scattered Castles, I will come forward out. In that database and you'll see that i worked for cia between this date and that date and it will have the dates of every compartment i ever held when i was read into them and the massive date um back in september of uh, 2009 when i was read out of them in mass the whole two dozen or so of these compartments that i had and so these folks um are in the same situation that we know that they worked where they say they work we know that um, they, their information is valid. And we, now the difference is we are allowing them to come forward with this information because now they have legislation to protect them. And so right. that is the biggest contribution to this should go to Senator Gillibrand of New York because she'll go down in history as having made this possible. Because without that legislation, none of this would happen. Um, so you know, yeah, there, there'll be um, further vetting and validation of these people as this first round comes forward. I'm sure there are others who will come forward afterwards. And that opens it up to the civilian world as well. Because we basically, I mean, so we have like many, many uh, government and military people coming forward. Well, that's interesting, but it's even more interesting to hear from civilians having the same experiences. And the only difference is like job title. So yeah, I was an engineer. I worked for this on this project for the government and I know this information. Uh, but I mean, that's not any more uh, or less valid than someone who says, yeah, I've had direct experiences and I was on board a craft and I, I flew it. 
Um, you know, I mean, what's the difference there? It's just job title. Um, but the experience itself is valid. Um, so yeah, I look forward to that time. And I think it, I, I, I'm pretty confident it will happen. I'd be very disappointed if it did not happen because basically um, I wasted two two years of my life doing this. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about what some people report, just sort of the trans medium nature of UFOs. I mean, you look at the, the Tic Tac incident, it's 80,000 feet, and then it's sea level. And we asked Richard Dolan about USOs, and he goes on for half an hour with all the data and evidence and under, underwater bases and everything else. So what are your thoughts on how they traverse from outer space to our atmosphere, under the water? What do you uh, what do you think about all that? Well, um, this this people really concentrate on anti-gravity anti-gravity and gravity because they think gravity is one of the uh, four forces of the universe um but if you talk to people who actually know like dr jack safardi he would discount gravity as being one of the four forces of the universe he'll say yes strong nuclear weak nuclear but electromagnetic and I spent 25 years in the CIA and six years in the Navy in the field of electromagnetic emissions. Radar is electromagnetic emissions. And so um, this is what I can say. Like, you, you, we all have heard of metamaterials. Yeah. yeah. And um, I said before, magnesium, bismuth, and zinc and a purity that can't be manufactured or found on earth but whatever they are let's just call them metamaterials and let's imagine that uh, they have uh, what we know as wave guides inside of them infused in them and a wave guide is basically a transmission line for electromagnetic ma magnetic uh, waveforms um, at extremely extremely high frequency we're talking like uh, billions and uh, trillions of cycles per second uh, so let's say there are these wave guys that are very tiny, like we call a millimeter wave. Uh, we all expose to millimeter wave anytime we go to the airport and we're asked to raise our hands and step, stand on the yellow little footprints there and zoom, zoom. And that's you, you just got blasted by millimeter wave. <laughs> and so that type of radiation, um, that type of, it's not radiation, but that type of uh, emission. Um, let's say it's infused into or generate and infuse into that metamaterial, um, that material may show some properties that are very interesting, including um, properties that will then overcome um, the weight and drag that aircraft feel. And what you have is thrust and lift. And so when you're on board that craft, and people say, well, you know, it's impossible, you know, all the G's they pull. Well, that's from the observer. Whether you're in your FA-18 piloting it or if uh, you're on the ground seeing it, whatever, however you encounter these craft, you think it's impossible. You know, no, there's probably no one in there because, you know, you, no one can withstand that many G's. Well, if you're on board the craft, you don't feel a damn thing. Uh, instead, you'll see everything around you shift away in various directions like you're spinning the globe like i got right behind me it's almost like you're spinning the globe it's the globe that changes you yourself your perspective doesn't change you're just moving around exactly right? yeah, and, yeah. Uh, dr safadi would use the example of a surfer um so you got a surfer on a surfboard and he's riding this wave. the surfer on a surfboard is on the surfboard he, he feels like he's steady on that surfboard and the wave he's riding is going past him. Yeah. All right. And so it's almost like that. Um, get on an airplane, um, the fastest one can go 585 miles per hour. If they really, really want to pump it up and they're running late, 585, let's say, miles per hour. Um, your body doesn't feel like you're going 585 miles per hour at all. Um, your body couldn't withstand 585 miles per hour if it was like on the surface going that fast. But you're in a container that's going 585 miles per hour and the sky is going past you and that's the closest non-technical analogy to describe how this phenomenon can happen and oh by the way part of that phenomenon is this um i, I hesitate to call melding of consciousness with the technology 
but it's part of that technology. Consciousness is part of that technology. Um, and also there's a little bit of time and spatial displacement, the time and space displacement occurring. So that when an aircraft like F-18 approaches it and it zips away, uh, the observer, the pilot sees it zipping away, but the uh, the, uh, the occupant of that craft that's zipped away, um, that, that occupant already has already discerned that craft being there and got out of the way before the observer senses that that craft got out of the way. And Dr. Safali has beautiful math to explain all that. Um, and I couldn't even like hope to explain it. But uh, if you want an interesting guest, I mean, have him. That's the on guy. Board. Yeah. Yeah. Have him on board uh, on your podcast and, and try to nail him down to explain it in a way that people can understand because he does get into the math uh, quite heavily. But oh, he math, was, um, math and I are not friends, John. Well, we had a <laughs> Jimmy Blanchett a couple episodes, the same idea. He's using yeah. geometric harmonics. I think we did a pretty good job breaking it down. I mean, All if right. it's over it's over your head, it's over your head. But yep. I think there's a lot of good information yeah. you can yeah. glean yeah. from that. And you mentioned metamaterials. And I don't want to forget this point because I'm a big fan of metamaterial. Uh -huh. When we had Gary Nolan on our show, I started asking him about, you know, there's this medal that was supposedly given from Art Bell to Linda Moulton Howe. It's supposed to be yeah. a piece of UFO. And as I'm talking, he disappears off the screen and he's like rummaging and doing something. And I didn't know what the hell he's doing. <laughs> Finally, I said, man, you better be reaching for something like a piece of that stuff. And sure enough, he grabs it and holds it up. He's like, yeah, it's this stuff right here. Yeah. And I'm like, and that's the same thing you were just mentioning, John, the magnesium layered bismuth and perhaps. But again, he wanted to kind of play a little bit he was like well yeah. how do we know it's not from a, the slag out of a smelting yeah. factory yeah, yeah. explaining the levels now this was previous to him making those statements the other day oh, yeah. where it was very clear aliens exist we have the craft we're reverse engineering them yeah. and i believe this within a hundred percent certainty that's big like we're in big boy yeah. land right now but i wanted to get your thoughts again on do we have and again you can't give anything away because you're former cia but so what you know or have been told do we actually have some of these exotic off earth materials that we're playing with trying to reverse engineer? Well, I'll say this while I was at CIA, I never been, ex I was never exposed to the materials itself. I was exposed to the fact that uh, a craft may exist made of these materials, okay. though I've never seen a craft. I would say this much um, you've heard of DIRDS, D I R D S, the Defense Intelligence Reference Documents that. Were released. So. No, okay, DIRDS, it, yeah. DIRDS. Write that down, Jay. Um, yep. What happened was that a FOIA request was sent to the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, which actually sponsored uh, all SAP. And uh, the FOIA request was for any materials or any kind of reporting uh, as a result of the study called all SAP. All right. So the DIA released, oh, there were these DIRDS, these Defense Intelligence. Um, reference documents that were released and there they are. And they're all like mostly like short white papers. And a white paper is just a think piece, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the cast of characters, you know, uh, who submitted them, one of them was Dr. Eric W. Davis. He submitted one of his and so forth. And there are other scientists submitted them as well. Well, what I saw was the cover and I, I'll say this much. It was the cover of not a thin little Third, it was a manual, a government manual on UAP propulsion and how they work. Interesting. Well, and that's all I'm going to say. It's Bob Lazar stuff. Yeah. Um, I I don't I hesitate to call it Bob Lazar stuff. Uh, let's just. <laughs> What's more advanced than that? Or uh, I I You're just not a fan of Bob. No, I I cannot validate or verify Bob Lazar in any way, shape, or form. Because I don't know him. I never met him. I only heard about him because of Art Bell. When, and uh, John Lear introduced him to the Art Bell crowd, Coast to Coast AM. And that's how I heard about him. Um, so I can't validate him. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to associate anything I know officially with anything Bob Lazar may have said in, unofficially. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, let's put let's call it Gary Nolan stuff. I mean, it's like right. what he would know, uh, what these other scientists like Hal Putoff and Eric W. Davis would know. And so it was a manual. It was a manual uh, of how propulsion systems work. I wasn't supposed to see it. 
And the person who laid out that manual on his desk wasn't supposed to leave it out there like the way he did. I did not open it. I saw the cover. I did not open it because if I opened it, I would have been charged with a security violation mm -hmm. with uh, bad consequences. So I saw it and the, the security violation is on the my engineer who left it out because he should have left it in the safe that I provided for him and his colleague, my other co uh, his coworker, both of whom I supervised, who I sent to the ORB working group, which was a real working group. Um, and so they looked at not only the orbs that fly, but also the legacy craft um, that we may know about. And that's more- Legacy the craft. Side of I like legacy. that. Is that the official term used on the inside for this well, type we of thing? We use uh, legacy program. Okay. Legacy program is like everything that happened because of Roswell and thereafter. Right. And anything we may have exploited from them that time. Uh, CIA is the uh, ran that uh, legacy program. I mean, that's not classified because if you look at Roswell in 1947, the only two intelligence agencies that existed is the Office of Naval Intelligence, CIA, when the C actually stood for Central before they broke it apart and you know created NSA and DIA and all these other agencies after it. So why are they um, with the new Arrow office? They're saying, well, we're only going to go back to 04 because that's yeah. when the Nimitz happened. And that's the first time that the spy one radar, the upgraded system started capturing things. We all know in, yeah. the, in our heart of hearts, these legacy programs existed. There is data yeah. going back to Roswell. If this is supposed to be the all domain or all, you know, anomaly well, resolution right. office, why are they not taking selective. everything into well, account? Yeah, it, it is selective. Uh, Jason, you, you, you nailed it right there. Yeah. Um, they did not want to talk about the legacy programs back then. Um, so they tied it to uh, November 2004, which was the Tic Tac uh, occurrence. Uh, going forward and so and they also restricted it to uh just military right. observations and discounted all of the civilian information whatsoever they just threw that out uh so yeah it was very selective and basically they were more interested although uh all sap looked at ufos earnestly and looked at high strangeness earnestly such as skinwalker ranch uh, what the UAP task force did was to just look at military observations of these craft uh, or this phenomenon, because they hesitate to call it craft. Yeah. This phenomenon um, uh, as it relates to aviation safety. So they tie everything to aviation safety in order to at least get it out from just the um, behind the scenes discussion into the public forum through Congress. Let's talk about aviation safety. Oh, everybody's comfortable with that. You didn't say UFO, thank goodness. Just yeah. aviation safety, right? And then they opened it up to, well, we don't know what they are. They could be Chinese, they could be Russian. Maybe not, maybe maybe not foreign adversaries or maybe they're balloons, maybe they're this, that, whatever, right? But they never talk about non-human craft. Right. And that's the right. smoking gun, right? Because that's I think, Jason, gun. you said it many times. Once you, once you admit craft, you have to go places you don't want to go. You have to talk about abductions, beings, cryptids, maybe even Bigfoot. Like it just we all go down that rabbit hole like yeah. a slide. Yeah. As soon as that first layer of the onion comes off, it's all coming off because now it's like, well, if that was the craziest thing that we had come up with and we were all nuts, now a portion of that is true. So hey, you got to look at the rest of it because now we're not nuts and right. we're validating that. Right. Yeah. So even, yeah. 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 Go I was ahead. gonna say even more aggravating than that, we have all these uh different agencies, government agencies. Yeah. I think there's too many cooks in the kitchen personally, but none of them are looking at the abductees. Yeah. The abductees um, should be priority number one. Or at least if they are, they're not open about it. They're not open about it. Yeah. Because that should be priority number one. That should be our base. What's yeah. going on with the abductees? What have they witnessed? What did they experience? What did they talk about with these entities? But maybe they give away their position by doing that same thing. Possible. If they're trying yeah. to just gloss yeah. over it. Then there are no such thing as UFOs. There are no aliens. There no. are no abductees. So it's kind of implicating when you're, you know, doing research with those people. We know it. We've always right. kind of known. But it's a difference between suspecting that and then right. confirming, yeah, we're doing yeah, it. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would go with um, um, more on along the lines of before we go there, we need to start here. Yeah, And you need to start with what Jason has said and what you've said now, just now, Louis, about mm -hmm. non-human. 
that word non-human attached to this phenomenon is the biggest stumbling block over the past decades of discussing this out in the open at all. So let's just give them a chance to say non-human. Now, right now, you have not seen an official statement about non-human. And I mean official statement, not just Dr. Gary Nolan yeah. in his uh, role as a consultant to the government. And people call him a CIA agent. No, he is not. He is not a CIA officer or a CIA agent. He's not associated with CIA in that way. But he does consult with the people who are working this who happen to be in government. So let's... Is a consultant, but beyond just one person saying it and a lot of rumors floating around in social media, we need to hear officially non-human. And we got real close because that legislation called the Intelligence Authorization Act of fiscal year 2023 uh, that came through the intelligence community, uh, intelligence committees of, of our Congress, they actually had that non-human language in it. What happened to it? Yeah. Well, the that strong language uh, that would have set up something beyond Errol, would have gotten rid of Errol, and would have set up a joint program office for uh, aerospace and undersea phenomenon. Then, you know, um, bringing forward uh, the idea that, you know, there's transmedian vehicles involved, that would have actually then brought to the public domain the non-human aspect immediately. That legislation got blended with the NDAA. Everyone knows about the NDAA. That only refers to the Department of Defense, Uniform Armed Services, Title 10, NDAA. That's, that's all DOD. The IAA is civilian CIA, mostly, a lot of it. That got blended, and, and the part of the blending process uh, someone arranged for all of that language to be taken out. So if you look at the NDA for FY23 and you do a word search for non-human, not going to find it. If you go back to the IAA, it was passed by the Senate and it passed the uh, intelligence community in the Senate by 16 to 0. Both the Democrats and Republicans all voted for it. If you look in that legislation and look for non-human, you're going to find it. Those terms are in there but it's not in what was passed that sustained Errol's work. We, I think the intelligence community wanted to get rid of Errol and replace it with something more meaningful that would have addressed those aspects of it, but that's not happening. Hmm. So I think part of this disclosure process was to redress that when it got taken out of the legislation, thirdly restricting uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick on what he can address under the legislation, what he's funded for, very narrow um, compared to what he could have been doing. Uh, I think that would be redressed through this disclosure process that's going forward. And then we can bring in non-human. And thanks to Dr. Gary Nolan, he fired the first shot across the bow, as we said, as we say. Um, so I think you hear more about that. And and then you can open up the other discussion because I mean, you had doctors, uh, you had uh, Jim Simivan on and you talked about his experiences. I talk about my experiences. I have a good friend at CIA who's retired who saw the lady in white, a la Chris Bledsoe's lady in white, before anyone knew about Chris Bledsoe and before he knew that there was a lady in white. Long before Chris Bledsoe's experience, he said, yeah, I saw this lady in white and he's a CIA officer. Wow. Um, so, you know, that discussion about abductions and so forth, that's all, I think that will come forward. Um Hopefully, it's it wasn't the U.S. military doing that. I don't want to go there because I mean that could go and get into some legal ramifications sure. of taking people against their will. Right. Um, so I don't want to even go there. That's that's a legal thing. Uh, let let uh, Danny Sheehan take care of that because he's a yeah. lawyer. And yeah, he's he the official UFO uh, lawyer of Congress. The UFO lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, he can address that. But let's let's just let the government say non-human first. And then uh, non-human craft, and then I hope people will a then ask um, who's driving them, right? And then yeah. the discussion can come forward that oh, they're non-human beings driving non-human craft, and <laughs> yeah. And so, so that just it's just a logical progression from from that point forward that will and, occur. And John, what do you think are the repercussions of let's say being 
even let's say halfway through disclosure, let's say that they admit to a lot of stuff, not everything, but to a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the people that have been keeping the secret, these mm-hmm. clandestine organizations, a lot of people have died with their secrets, especially when they grew up in different times or it's it shut up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't tell anybody about it and people kept their word. Men were different back then. We, we kept to our word and we didn't say anything, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of people's lives have been ruined uh, by these organizations or other people trying to keep this quiet Mm -hmm. and there's got to be at some point some people are going to say hey wait a minute you guys did this to me back in the 80s you were aware of this long before you came out with this closure and you kept you told us to be quiet Mm -hmm. there is going to be those people and it's going to come out that people are going to be upset Uh, in your personal experience or your personal uh, opinion what do you think that's going to snowball into like what what's that going to create for us as a society to now have the government come out and say it's really happening. Yes, I th- in the U.S. government, um, um, U.S. citizens, um, people here in this country have the right of redressing the government, a redress of grievances to the government. It's in the Constitution. Right. So there's a legal process for that to happen. And so let that process go forward. If, if they have a case, um, they will be heard. Uh, mm-hmm. But now at least they have some ammunition in court if it comes to that where they can say, well, the government has said this, you know, that's part of the uh, the d- discovery phase of any case like that, where you gather all the evidence that you have. And um, now, instead of saying, oh, we're going to dismiss this case because it has no merit, what are you talking about non-human? Oh, now you, you can bring that into you as ammunition on, for your case. So there's a redress of government process. And again, I'm going back to Danny Sheehan, he would know how that works. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I hesitate to answer your question. Not being a lawyer, <laughs> I don't know how to answer it actually. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that you know, generally, um, there's a redress of grievances process guarantee in the U.S. Constitution, where individuals who feel like they are harmed can then bring forth their case and bring forth the evidence for that case and call right. witnesses, and right. the witnesses uh, 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 might be for people who you know who worked in the program. Says yes. I can confirm that these things happen, and and then uh, and then uh, they'll be having a case against those who are in the government, and you know you have two sides, and let that discovery process happen and see what settles out there. But I don't want to go there because that's law legal. And it is. I don't want to. I don't want to prejudice anything like saying, "Oh, see, I don't. I don't want to be part of that conversation." The right. CIA officer John Ramirez uh, said this, and I don't want to be used as evidence either for or against. Yeah, uh, but. Yeah. I just want to say that there is a process for that. And for those who are personally injured in the sense that they had experienced uh, some psychological damage, uh, there are organizations to help them. Yep. And one of them is the UAP Medical Coalition. The uh, uh, There is a, a site uh, for them, and I wish I had it on my fingertips. Uh, but... Um, that's uh, a, by Ted Rowe, right? Ted Rowe works on that. Uh, Ted Rowe is part of that. Yes, that yeah. that organization there. Um, <clears throat> that's a great resource because then he can, uh, through that organization, you can see other resources out there in in your community. Uh, who, there might be therapists out there who are trained to work with these experiencers because they themselves are experiencers. So these are uh, um, like a psychologist, a psychiatrist, for example, are, and they're not going to like, first thing, oh, we need to cure you of this like craziness and here, take this. They're not gonna do that. They're gonna, they're gonna be very sympathetic toward what you're saying uh, right. to understand and coming from a place of like compassion. It's very important uh, that they understand what you're saying and to provide resources for you to help you with that experience that you may have had uh, all of mine been positive, but I recognize that not all are positive. Some are very negative. Mm. So I would, I would go with uh, Ted Rose uh, organization. If you could put that in a link somewhere uh, for this, yeah. um, that, would, that would be very helpful to people. Sure. Yeah. And if yeah. anybody has had an yeah. experience, we have quite a few reach out to us. We provide them resources or right. Yeah. Even if they have videos and things that they want investigated, sure. we get them in the hands. Yeah. This last week we had two or three sent to us and, um, you know, we're happy to to help in that respect. But I know you're a techie guy, weapon systems guy, radar guy. And when I was making my notes last night, the first thing that came into my mind was a recent interview we did with filmmaker Darcy Weir. He documented uh-huh. everything at NASA. He's done like 15 movies. His latest uh-huh. one, um, 
is in regards to NASA. And when we were mm -hmm. chatting with him, he was going into these, I think they're called DS2 spy satellites. I could be wrong with that, but basically- Oh, DSP. Was, what's that? DSP. DSP, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So the, the long and short of it was that we know there's high quality imagery captured because there exists this network of satellites. Now, I'm not going to ask you to talk about <clears throat> specifics because you did work in intelligence, but what are your thoughts on sort of NASA? You know, in his film, he's got video that's NASA video showing UAP yeah. doing amazing things. So many. And NASA's so many now shots, just, yeah. yeah. How are they now just waking up? We kind of read through that. But I wanted to get your thoughts on the whole NASA joining the search for uh, non-human intelligence, we'll call it. Uh, yeah, I, I can address that. Uh, in fact, I can. There's a lot of things I can talk about our our systems, uh, particularly in this day and age. Uh, the NRO celebrated its 60th anniversary uh, in 2021, and they released a brochure, uh, pretty much describing everything that they fly, including today. And so they talked about what was once a top secret uh, compartmented program called uh, the. Uh, KH-11 Keenan program. Um, the KH-11 was once uh, compartmented under top secret Byman, B-Y-E-M-A-N, Byman, and Byman protected all of these overhead programs and Byman was like gone. It's no longer uh, applicable. So yeah, there were a lot of uh, these sensor uh, detections of this phenomenon uh, that were not uh, human. They were not uh, advanced aircraft uh, by our adversaries or us that did display those five observables that uh, Lou Elizondo uh, talks about. Um, and so as far as NASA's role in it, um, uh, we have witnesses, eyewitnesses called astronauts who were likely told not to talk about this, to not say what you see, what you've seen. Um, and I would think that if NASA was being honest about what they're doing in the UAP field, um, ultimately they should release the un, uh, the non-airbrushed photos that they have. And I'll say that much. Um, and then that would be another interesting discussion uh, with NASA. Uh, NASA is supposed to be a, a civilian uh, space agency. The Classified space agency is called NRO. Oh. So NASA is the civilian unclassified version of the NRO classified space program. And so it's NRO that uh, designs, builds, and launches um, many of what we, uh, much, almost everything what we have um, circling the globe, controlled by the US government on behalf of the Australian and UK governments and also Canada. Um, as one of the recipients of the data from the satellites, uh, New Zealand as well. So it's shared amongst the five eyes. Uh, there, there's, there is going to be a lot of data there. And uh, so that's what started the Orb Working Group, is that they actually saw this data. They thought it was something wrong with the, uh, well, first uh, they thought, you know, Occam's razor, uh, oh, it could be uh, advanced adversarial technology. And so my branch, the ELINT or Electronic Intelligence Analysis Branch, was given the task of looking at the uh, adversarial aircraft that are very advanced. Uh, what we see, um, I can say this much, let's see, very careful. Um, let's say when something of uh, high technology belonging to an adversary is still in the planning stages, uh, usually CIA gets to know about it beforehand. And that's all I'm going to say. So they might like design one or two and fly them covertly. Uh, but we can, uh, if we're lucky, detect that. And so we can gather information about it. So we had some information about some advanced technology that um, was uh, the Russians were uh, experimenting with, and it's called plasma stealth, where they would take a, uh, a plasma stealth generator and attach it to one of their aircraft and it creates a plasma field around the aircraft which uh, radar uh, cannot uh, lock onto. It's much more sophisticated than what we did, which was use conformal faceted arrays. You know, uh, if you look at the F-117, it's all faceted. Yeah. That's what we did, but with radar materials, ablative materials, they call it. But they did this generator. You could just hook it up on an aircraft and boom, you're stealth. 
Um, so we knew about their experiments with that. We looked at uh, two aircraft in particular. Uh, one is called the uh, SU Sukhoi, SU-34 fullback, uh, the fullback aircraft, and the other was the um, MiG-31 uh, flanker. Is that the flanker? Yes, fulcrum? No, flanker. No, I'm sorry, MiG-31 um, Foxhound. So the MiG-31 Foxhound is holds the uh, alt altitude record for an air-breathing jet. It went up to 123,000 feet. It wow. reached there. I don't think it stayed there very long because there's not a lot of combustible like air for its <laughs> engines, but it, it got up there um, and it flew around a little bit and had to come back down. But that aircraft is phenomenal. It, it, it flies in combat uh, mode, 85 to 100,000 feet. It was designed to shoot down the SR-71, which is why the SR-71 will not fly. They grounded them all. Can't fly it. If they have. Um, so it wasn't that. It wasn't these two aircraft or any other aircraft that's in the Russian inventory. And we knew when they would take off because, you know, afterburners or jet, you know, Go back to your uh, defense support program satellites, which are no longer flying anymore. They've been taken offline a long time ago. We have other sensors. There are IR sensors that can detect missile launches and uh, aircraft. Um, there weren't any of those. There were no events like that. So we, we know when they, as soon as they light off from the runway, yep, here they go. And um, so it wasn't any of that. Hmm. They were actually like unusual things <laughs> that wasn't explained. Uh, Oh, it must be something wrong with the satellite. No, nope, not wrong with satellite. Not wrong with software processing, satellite images, all of that. So that started the Orb Working Group, which actually met because I, I signed the travel documents for my two engineers I sent, um, and they went there um, as representing CIA along with other CIA officers. Uh, I was invited to join to be read into the full program that they had, and I go, no, thank you. If I ever got read in, you would never hear from me. You right. wouldn't have heard from me. Right. So I didn't get read in, but I knew what it was about and everything. And um, so people are saying, well, you, you're you lying because uh, if this was a real program, you wouldn't be able to talk about it. Ah, I wrote to CIA before it came out and saying, I know these things. Is it okay? And they go, it's unclassified. So, okay. You know, so yeah, there were, there were programs to detect these objects. Um, uh, and NASA probably has a lot of information there. And I would not doubt if they got rid of um, data by airbrushing it out and telling the astronauts not to talk about it. So as far as this group, that's uh, I think they're reporting uh, May 31st in a few days. Yeah. Have you seen the list of questions, though, that they're supposedly asking? <laughs> I would like to see that. They, they because, said they polled yeah. people and these were the most popular <laughs> questions. They definitely didn't poll anybody who's a ufo nut or interested yeah. in this topic yeah, be, be be aware that uh beware i guess beware that some of this is like uh orchestrated in some way yeah i want to give nasa some credit though that they're going to do the what they can but nasa at this meeting is operating prior to disclosure yeah so they're going to be restricted like uh, dr patrick and what he can say and they're going to be restricted about what they can say. So I wouldn't it would not surprise me that NASA now in a few days will say things. And then NASA after disclosure will say something different. And after disclosure, they'll be a little more honest about what they know. Um there are there is a CIA officer uh, embedded in that uh study group. I was I'm not gonna call out his name, but he was in CIA uh in the imagery field. Um he worked for an organization called the National Photographic Interpretation Center which was part of the Director of Science and Technology when I was there. And now it's called the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which has all of the photographic and video data of all of these UAPs. Um, and he's there, but he, you know, he was associated with uh, Digital Globe and Maxar Technologies, which provide the imagery for Google Earth, for example. Yeah. And he's there, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that he's there as a plan or anything, but he would know the background information um, as to what we we are really interested in, and maybe he won't be prepared to uh, at that at this time reveal any, anything that he might know. And I know I'm going to get a phone call about what just told you. <laughs>
basically well, it's it's disclosure foreplay you know what i mean you got to kiss yeah. a little bit before you progress to anything else and that's yeah i would say that seems like that's what's going on in first have yeah, some dinner. exactly take her out to dinner you know what i mean like do yeah. something yeah. when um, is this disclosure date though i mean you, you uh, i can't say that. i know you can't say are we talking months years <coughs> a decade i was surprised that uh steve steve bassett you know he he hashtag months not years that was the episode mm -hmm. we made with him he basically came right up now to the defense of people that are a little bit critical of steve he's been saying this for decades but yeah never as loud and as affirmative as right now yeah. saying but but i also think steve in his quest to find the truth mm -hmm. is a little bit jumping to conclusions like has to be aliens they have to be in craft no such thing as interstellar interdimensional and I, I don't think it's good for people to throw out the baby. With yeah, the yeah, yeah. I don't I, know, right? I, I would tell him. And um, full disclosure, he and I did have a conversation at the UFO conference 2023 in San Francisco. And all I did was, uh, Mr. Bassett, I endorse what you're saying. And that's all I'm going to say. You know, <laughs> but we're talking months. <laughs> you're not doing years. good work. You're doing good work. Keep it up. Keep it up. Uh, but I think he's on the right track. Um but time is right, especially since we have uh, in the United States, uh, there's these this presidential primary campaigns revving up. And traditionally, it revs up after our Labor Day, uh, which is in, uh, the first, is it first Monday in, in September. September, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, and between that time and the holiday season, which is Thanksgiving Day here in the United States. So between those two dates, I would say that's a good time for it to come forward. Because it captures that early uh, the presidential campaign season and before the holidays when, you know, no one cares. Uh, the only thing they want to see in the sky is Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't care about <laughs> any non-humans flying. Uh, uh, but, uh, boy, that would be something. Santa Claus is actually non-human. Hmm. But anyway, um, see, I, I think it's in, those, in that time frame. It would be uh, a good time for the government to do whatever it's going to do. Nice. So I, I have one more question for me, and then we'll get into some uh, listener questions, if that's okay, sure. uh, really quickly. But my, my last question is sort of the, the party that's waiting in the wings right now, which I think will have a huge impact going forward after disclosure, is Space mm -hmm. Force. Mm, right because mm -hmm. we're not hearing much about them right now but there's something's mm -hmm. afoot there yeah and you know with disclosure i think space force will come more into play uh because now you know it's our mm -hmm. defense system in space so obviously anything <clears throat> alien related or inter or um you know uh terrestrial versus extraterrestrial that they're in charge of that defense so just in your personal uh, opinion like do you, do you think space force is going to have a big part to play going forward with this disclosure movement well uh, going back to uh what the u.s government can detect those detection systems uh for space and for the uh, space domain as they call it part of this what space force likes to call space situational awareness mm. part of that um uh, area of Space Force um, will come into play for sure because they own the systems. They operate the systems that have detected these objects in space. So it's not just the NRO, which is more for the intelligence community or people like me who are intelligence analysts to be able to do their work and reporting on uh, developments uh, of our foreign adversaries. But they're they're looking at everything. We we in the intelligence community don't look over the United States. We're not allowed to look over the United States. Uh, we can't spy on our Five Eyes partners at all. So we, by the way, Canadians can spy on Americans, and Americans can spy on on Canadians. But we can't spy on our own people. Uh, just a hint about you know information exchanges that might happen. Uh, but I, I won't go there. <laughs> I don't want to talk. I'll get in trouble with the Canadian security establishment. I think it's called yes. CSC. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No They're pretty good that. at their job too, because yeah, you yeah. never hear anything from them. Like yes. you never heard, Oh, it's a CSIS leak. Never, ever. Yes. <laughs> They're listening we... right now. So hello, yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice to see you today. Yeah. yeah. The C shouldn't stand for Canada. It should stand for covert. Cause they, you're right. They do very good at what they do. Very but good. Anyway, yeah. yeah. But going <laughs> back to space force, you know, they, they do have the sensors that I've detected. 
uh, these objects. Um, they do have them. Um, I contend that they didn't have to filter anything in the radar because I know how radars work. Yeah. Um, the radars collected everything and it's in truck files that they can go back. Uh, what they did filter was not anything that the radar did, but what the humans did. And that what the humans did was to ignore these other objects. And when they say, oh, well, let's pay attention to these objects, uh, they're there. And that's what happened. So, you know, I did a whole thing with Chris Leto about how the radars work and what the radars are. Uh, most of them are across your country as part of the North warning system. Um, so, you know, I, I think Space Force is going to be very important because they own the sensors, uh, if anything. And their domain goes from 50 miles above Earth all the way up to above and beyond, you know. Yeah. Buzz Lightyear territory, <laughs> you know, so. And here we have SETI looking for radio signals. <laughs> I don't understand SETI at all. You, no, you, me you neither. Know, yeah. Talk to Jimmy Blanchett and, and you know, I, I joined Jimmy and scratching our heads. What, what are they looking for? Yeah. Yeah. You don't you don't have to look up there too far. <laughs> it's like looking through a keyhole and then expecting yeah. that you're going to solve yeah. the problem. Like, well, and yeah. look at the amount of time involved, right? I, I watched a thing the other day on the wow signal. We all really want to believe, but we're looking for radio transmissions, which is very archaic. But just the amount of time involved, if they did send a response from some galaxy that's how many light years away? Maybe that was sent a million years ago. We got the wow signal. We're waiting for something else. Maybe they, that doesn't exist anymore. Maybe that civilization is gone. And it's just because of the the nature of just physics being what they are, it's not a practical way of communicating with anything. I know a little bit of wattage can go very far into outer space. It's cheap and you can sort of spray and pray. You can hit a massive area and that's what Jimmy's doing. But to your point, John, you don't have to go very far. They're right here. People send yeah. them to us. They catch them with their cell phones. You know, they in come the right through Alberta your walls at in the middle of the night. Yeah, <laughs> you don't need to yeah. have stuff that's that big. You don't need to look for archaic modes of of uh, of communication, right? And any again, we're we're thinking about this phenomenon like humans, not like non human intelligence as would. And maybe that's impossible for us to do because we're limited by our sensors and what we can see and what we can hear and all that. But but last question I want to ask you before we get into the uh, few viewer questions from Jason is the idea of uh, hybrids. And uh, a lot yeah. of these abduction cases talk about genetic material being removed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Whitley Strieber is very graphic, um, but essentially they're taking seed from males and ovum from females for some purpose. And you can really go down the woo train and the rabbit hole on that. But what are your thoughts just as, as an opinion on sort of hybrids and what the need for this genetic material from humans could potentially be. Well, I've always contended that we are all hybrids. All humans are hybrids from the very beginning. Even if uh, if you don't believe in any of this or don't even follow any of this as we enthusiasts do, yeah, uh, let's say that you believe in the book of Genesis. Let's go there. And in the book of Genesis, you have a divine being, non-human, who imparted its image onto humans. Yeah. Okay, so that right there tells you that humans, if you are very religious and believe in Genesis, humans are part divine, that is non-human, and part human. That, And then if you further believe in, uh, in the Bible, let's say the New Testament, um, you would believe that, you know, that Jesus was part divine and part human. That's the definition Instead of saying divine, we can say non-human, uh, a human of a non-human being of um, advanced consciousness, let's say, and uh, incorporated uh, with the DNA of a human. So right there, you have, um, if I could rewrite the Bible, I would make it into uh, what I call an exo, exo Bible. That is uh, something that incorporates this phenomenon, because then if you rewrite it that way, Using what we know so far about this phenomenon, you'll have a remarkable story of visitations by non-humans with humans and the interactions between the two. Because then, you know, in, in the Bible, it says that Mary was like uh, visited by angels, taken up somewhere and uh, was told that she would carry uh, this baby. And that it would the baby would be not from a her human uh, Joseph. Right. And so. Did she get implanted? 
and then brought back. It so was middle of the this. night, right? It was gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's classic. I mean, yeah. You know, and then you have Jesus, um, you know, with the trans. They call it. Is it called the Transfiguration or something? Uh, you have the old prophets coming down, and one of the disciples uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, was awake and, and witnessed it. That, oh, there's Moses. There's you know these other old prophets of old with Jesus, and it was like shimmering light. You know, my God, I mean that's. The whole Bible is full of experiences written by experiencers. Prophets are like channelers, right? So going back to um, your hybrid question, and we're all hybrids, I think. Um, but what I was told um, in a meeting I cannot prove happened. Um, and I wish I'd have taken the meeting agenda, which was unclassified, and the meeting uh, attendees, which was unclassified at the time. Um, what I was told that the, um, the CIA has had an interest in alien DNA and that the interest goes back to, uh, after World War II. Hmm. Now, do we have the means to, um, sequence the human genome back then? No, but I always get arguments that, well, we didn't know about DNA after World War II. Well, DNA was discovered in the 1860s. So they knew there was something called DNA from the 1860s. And so DNA existed, but they just, just did not, was not able to, they were not able to sequence it all completely. That didn't happen until like recent years and through the 90s and early 2000s when we finally had the technology to do so. But what they discovered was, oh my gosh, you know, there's some really interesting things about human DNA. There's these splices in human DNA that did not occur because of natural evolution. And so how did those places occur? You know, what happened? Um, so I know from sources, again, I'm sorry, I cannot reveal these sources. So if you don't believe me because I can't reveal the sources, so be it. Um, but uh, the hybrid story is part of the phenomenon story. It's a very important part, as are these experiences, as are implants. Implants are an important part of the story as well. Why are we hybrids or why are do we have implants? I do not know. I was told I had an implant, uh, not from anybody in government, but by people who are what we call light workers. And people look at light workers as, you know, these people who are like out there in uh, new agey land and we can discount them. But um, they helped me understand what was going on with me, my own personal self. And independently they said i can one of them said your your implant gives me a headache and i just want to call out lorette yes <laughs> lorette told me that uh my implant gave her a headache um i have another uh, uh light worker named nancy who said the same thing and um it didn't give her a headache but she could hear it and then uh, uh, my light worker glenn uh spelt with two ends and she uh is going back to vicenza italy uh, she said, you know, you're actually an alien living in a human body. I said, well, I knew that all along. My wife tells me that all along. <laughs> when I'm not being a good husband. <laughs> yeah. Can't do the dishes, honey. I'm an alien. Yeah. <laughs> She's an angel. I'm the alien, right? Yeah. So anyway. Um, but seriously, yeah, I, I think hybrids are part of the story um, that might be revealed much later on if they ever reveal it. Um, I'm saying that the government knows that the hybrid's real. I'm saying the government knows the implants are real. Right. The implant story is coming out now. Uh, Jim Simivan talked about implant. That's uh, one of our uh, one of our friends, Chris Grant. That's a, was related to this. Uh, he asked that because you had mentioned it before that the government admitted that uh, humanity are, are pretty much uh, a hybrid species, and he was wondering uh, hybrids of what specifically, like. Do we kind of have an idea or is it just right now it's unknown, but we know that there's obviously something there. Well, you know, people have seen Nordics on board craft. Right. And the Nordics are closest to us biologically. Um, that's my best guess. Um, I don't know what we're hybrids of. Uh, I do know through natural evolution that um, the embryos of humans and the embryos of reptiles earth reptiles have similar characteristics like not 
entirely similar, but they're like muscle groups in the embryo human hand hmm. that are also found in reptiles. You Even know, in the brain, there's a, a primitive part of the brain that they call the reptile brain. It's mainly associated with like um, um, basic functions, breathing and things like that. But yeah, like we have a tail when we're in uterine, we're in an egg. It's, yeah. There are a lot of reptilian before mammals evolved. We came from single celled organisms and then everything else yeah. before looking the way we do. So right. we but, share some. Yeah. The question is, uh, did that, uh, did we result as an uh as natural evolution or was there an intervention yeah. and then you have anthropologists saying ah there's this missing gap somewhere yeah we can't account for this missing gap and i'm telling you that's the part where this intervention occurred that's why um, there's no missing link we're trying to find a fossil record of yeah, some animal missing link, that missing link, connects yeah. us to that to the apes maybe there is no such thing maybe we are a separate lineage because like well, I, you said there's a piece yeah missing. there's an acceleration of us um yeah. Uh, may have occurred well there's uh, there's what there's five apes right because you got the chimpanzee the gorilla humans are in the middle of the genome i think you got a bonobos and then the orangutan right mm -hmm. uh but out of all the apes we stand out the most right. like look at what we're able to do today you know what i mean otherwise yeah yeah and th there were other uh proto humans as well that didn't yeah. quite make it they didn't That's make true. it uh or we may have intermarried with them our species, evolved with homo, them into what we are now yeah, right homo yeah. sapiens sapiens with other uh sapiens uh species um so yeah it's a complicated story uh but isn't it i, I find it interesting that um, when we look at like well the nordics are obvious because they look more closer to us mm -hmm. um but if you look at like even the gray um they're kind of humanoid in the sense that they have a head a torso two arms and two legs two eyes little slits for nostrils but everything is there where it's supposed to be essentially um so there's a lot of uh, similarities in what people experience as non-human and humans so i don't know if everyone got a chance at helping us <laughs> quote unquote uh with their dna but we seem to be closer to the nordics than than any other non-humans uh, maybe the nordics are humans maybe they've been here longer than we have i don't know good point there's, I, I don't know. Yeah, you made I, an interesting point on another show in terms of like evolution and things like that. And I think the quote was like, if dinosaurs survived in a parallel universe and came back, yeah. could that explain some things that we're seeing? I thought yeah, that was very interesting. Reptilians. Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, that's all speculation. There's nothing I know personally from anything the government knows professionally. I, I have no idea. Yeah, uh, it's fun to speculate, though. And, I, you know, I, I tell people a lot of things I say, you know, I had to, like, sort this out for myself. I had to bring it into terms that made sense so that I, I myself personally could handle it. Otherwise, I would like could be in a compulsive, obsessive mode of trying to, like, put pieces together and, like, spending my entire life doing it, you know, and I'm telling people. Just live your life and put together your own theory of everything. It doesn't have to be right for anyone else except yourself. And so if you have your own theory of everything, and this is the way things are, and it could be more of a traditional religious kind of thing uh, toward Western Christianity, that's fine. If you can live with that, and this is the way it is, and this is why things are. And with my uh, own personal theory of everything, which I've more openly discussed in these podcasts, you know, find one for yourself and just stick with it and stick with it until you get more information right. and then you can change it you just and don't let anyone convince you that something is wrong with you because of your beliefs you know no one challenges people's religious beliefs everybody wants to challenge everyone's uh et beliefs you know you know that means i don't know why that is and it's so complex that, you know, we, we, we can't, there's no it, people state absolutes, unfortunately, in this field. Uh, there's some people that right now, because disclosures, I think is coming at hand. There's two people who popped to mind. I'm not going to name them, but they're like, look at me, look at me. I'm Mr. Disclosure. I'm the one who's going to have all the answers. Yeah. And that's not how it's going to work. We need to all work together as a yeah. group of people like yourself that have served their country and citizens that are experiencing this. We all collectively, like you ever see somebody that, uh, or a corporation or somebody says, hey, can I get the general population to 
help us out with this issue. And some people mm -hmm. are amazing. Like even a CGI mm -hmm. for Star Wars, some kid in his basement did better yeah. CGI for Star Wars than Star Wars did. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, giving that information to the general population and letting people that are creative that can think outside the box in on it, that's how we're gonna make progress. Like imagine mm -hmm. if we had a guy like Nikola Tesla alive today mm -hmm. that was investigating this phenomenon, how much mm -hmm. further we would be along right? Because of the way he thought and looked at things. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting. You're, you made a valid point there. People attack everybody and we don't know what's going on. We're all just swinging away like yeah. idiots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I have a uh, Krista Alexander, uh, one of our friends as well. She said, um, you mentioned that government employees refer to UAPs as entities of light. Does that mean actual conscious beings made of light? And what are the, what are the implications? Oh, uh, some UAPs manifest themselves as light orbs. That's that's what I said. Okay. And they, they are light orbs. And um, that is what most people are seeing today. A few see uh, structured craft, as we call it. Um, when was the last time anyone reported seeing a saucer shape? Right. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're, we're seeing light orbs. They're manifesting as light orbs. Um, and what I said that the government is aware that these light orbs have some aspect with consciousness. Mm -hmm. And there I give credit to uh, Dr. Stephen Greer because he had a film called uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And in that film, he made an accurate statement that the government became interested in this earnestly. It went to another level when it discovered that there was a higher consciousness aspect to this phenomenon. And that is a true statement. Mm -hmm. So something about consciousness and this phenomenon is associated. And that's that's what I was saying. And uh, this needs to come forward later as part of disclosure. Right now, we just the big hurdle is just saying non-human. Right. Officially from the government, you know, non-human. To have someone who was in a position of authority as like a head of an intelligence agency or uh, a secretary of a cabinet level department to say non-human that that is huge uh, yeah. a huge omission and we let's go there first but I think unless we explore the higher consciousness aspect of this phenomenon um, this will go nowhere because it's just things flying in the sky and who cares about that okay they're flying in the sky but why are they here um, and why are they interacting with us what's the message they want us to understand to learn what is the lesson to learn? And I think that's important where consciousness comes into play. And I wanted to convey that. Nice. Uh, our friend, uh, Russell uh, Pickering, Louis, he asked, do you, uh, do you consider CE5 contact by casual experience seekers safe? It depends on how you approach CE5. And I would say that... Um, and Stephen Greer is a uh, Dr. Stephen Greer is a good uh, resource for this. He he has held the CE five encounters out where he uh, facilitated the encounter, and people there have seen uh, these orbs of light, and other people also at that same gathering looking at the same place see nothing. It's almost like you have to be open to the experience in order to experience it. Right. And if you come with fear. If you come with doubt and fear, uh, you might not have that same experience. Um, let me go to Skinwalker's uh, Ranch for a second there. And there you have defense intelligence agency officers who spend their careers looking at adversarial foreign technology. And not necessarily from a point of fear, but adversarial, that it's the enemy. And you have that mindset with anything like that. And you bring your instruments there to make measurements. And then all of a sudden that phenomenon presents itself as something bad, something uh, evil, something like dangerous. Well, you brought that with you. Yeah. And you're going to take it back home with you. Yeah. If that's, if that is your perspective, but that didn't happen to me and to others who come with like more openness because I had an earlier encounter with the phenomenon. I welcomed it. And the only disappointment I had was that they did not let me go, that mm. I had to come back. 
So I, I don't like the word abducted. I can understand that if you think it's involuntary. Yes, it's the abduction, perhaps. I was taken and I was upset I was brought back because I don't want to be on this planet. I want to like take a ride with them. I mean, if I, I told my wife and my wife have a, and I have a pack. If they pick us up, adios, <laughs> go. We gave our permission to go. You know, <laughs> cancel my Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> well, 90% of experiencers say that they <coughs> want to do it again. It was yeah. only about 10% of people said it was the worst experience of their life. The rest, yeah. even if it seemed strange or wasn't comfortable, even Whitley Strieber, like he has a hard time sleeping and all the rest and he's gone yeah. through some stuff, but he's not running and hiding. Like if they said, right. Hey, Whitley, like we're going to level with you and tell you exactly why do you want to know? Oh yeah. He wants to know. And he would probably do it again. If yeah. Given the chance, yeah, I would say before you go into C five, you jump in a cold. Uh, learn something about mindful meditation. Have a meditation practice for yourself. Um, and there are ways to do it. Uh, my good friend Glenn Younger uh, in Italy, she has a wonderful YouTube video. I'll send you the links later uh, if you want to post it. It's a sure. great way to learn how to meditate. You get your mind in that place, and you just got to do it. Right, it takes practice. You got to practice meditation, and if you, you'll flow into it naturally, and then go have your CE5 experience, and then you'll start getting messages. Because if you're there in CE5 just to say, prove me, prove to me that you're real, um, it's not going to happen for you. Yeah, uh, You go there to say, I'm here humbly, and I accept your presence. And if you have anything to share with me, please share it Yeah, for my good and for the good of others. Come with that attitude, and you have a very positive experience. Yeah, you wouldn't mess around with a Ouija board and be sprinkling ashes and blood on the thing, trying to make some spookiness happen. It's right. going to happen. And it's going to happen, yeah. You're going to yeah. get a hitchhiker effect from it if you're not yeah. strong mentally, even the ones that are, that are very good at it. And a lot of remote viewers, they have things that have clung to them yes. as a result of messing around with that stuff. And mm -hmm. they're like professional, if you could say such a thing, right? So mm -hmm. the average Joe probably should have a, a healthy respect for, you know, it's like like a hurricane. You don't want to be near one, but you respect nature because you see what it can do. So go at it with an open mind, humble attitude. And you probably get get more out of it. Right. That's what you're yeah, looking for. Great, in the first place. Great point. Great points, Louis. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's like your consciousness welcoming another consciousness mm -hmm. to make interaction with you, mm -hmm. regardless of your physicality. Right. I heard it one time explained where, you know, now people are doing these psilocybin microdoses or DMT uh -huh. or things like that. Back maybe 15 years ago, there was a substance called salvia and it was a mm -hmm. shamanic herb and people smoked it. And mm -hmm. the, um, I was actually in a, a part of Vancouver, which is very eclectic. There's a lot of mm -hmm. like crystal shops and things yeah. like that. And I walked by and they were selling it and I thought yeah. it was illegal. So I, I didn't want to have any. I just asked the guy, like, tell me a little bit about this stuff. And he says, people that use it, ser uh, ser searching for answers or seeking something, you'll get an answer. If you're smoking this just to get high, it will scare the life out of you because mm -hmm. it's trying to mm -hmm. tell you don't mess with things that you shouldn't be messing with. So I think it's very much like that. You know, like it can be used equally for enlightenment or to scare the shit out of you. So choose wisely how deep you want to go and who you, yeah. you don't know who you're playing with, essentially. Right. Right. Yeah. And it works because um, what you want to do is 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 um, I don't know if separate is the right word, but. I think displace. I'll use displace. You want to displace your physical senses from your consciousness. Right. Because you're so restricted by what you can see, smell, touch, hear, you know, so forth, um, that that's where you go to. And so these are like psychoactive ways of achieving that. Right. Yeah. You can do it. I, I'm saying that you don't need to. Um, it could help. But you don't need to if you you can do it through meditation as well. If you master meditation, you get the same results. Also, uh, uh, call holotropic breathing. This breath exercise you can do that put you in that state. John Mack used to do that, didn't he? Oh, did he did? Yeah, yeah. I think he work. did like yeah. a breathing exercise. That's how he hypnotized people too. He would oh, uh, do the yeah. breath work. Yeah, yeah. The breath work does help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. One more question. Uh, this is uh, by the way when we asked. Uh, people to submit their questions on Twitter, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Like it sure. went, uh, people went nuts, right? They know you're only doing two more interviews, so they want to get those questions in. But well, one uh, more after this, we're uh, right. we're second last. I don't know if I'm happier that we got you at the end or at the beginning, but we're just happy that we got uh, you. So I, I think uh, now I'm able to say more than I could at the beginning. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Everything happened for a reason. 
Exactly. Yeah. There you uh, go. This this question comes from I guess this is how you pronounce it, Pyort on uh, Twitter. But he says, "Will the average person in a mass scale have a direct contact, whether telepathically or some other way, with the phenomenon?" On a mass scale. On a mass scale, like after disclosure, will people have some sort of? Will everybody get some sort of telepathic? Because there's two disclosures. There's ours and theirs. Right. Right. I, right. I would say good points, uh, Jason. Um, what we're going to, I think what the, uh, the U S government is going to disclose is the presence of non-human in- intelligence on the right. planet. Uh, the fact that the craft we see, uh, is non-human and also the fact that, uh, Oh, by the way, we try to make one mm. uh, ourselves. Uh, every, everything Dr. Gary Nolan stated, uh, I would go with that. I, I think he's very accurate in what he said. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what will be disclosed. Um, as far as a mass sighting, yeah, it's pretty much up to them. Yeah. That's what I hope for. I, I keep asking them, you know, you can settle it right now. Just Phoenix show lights up. 2.0. Uh, yeah, like everywhere. And um, the message I get back from them is uh, that now is not the time. Mm. No. Yeah. We're not ready. Another Phoenix light incident, like what took place in 97. Oh, that happens again with that. the technology yeah. that we have, all the cell phones, like thousands of images of the same object or, or whatever. Like, dude, that thing was massive. Um, you know, yeah. something like that is going to happen again. We've had mass sightings throughout history. It's just yeah. now we're going to capture it. And I think that is going to solidify things. That's one thing that, you know, whatever these clandestine operations may be operating, but they yeah. can't control that. They can't control the inner comings of these entities we, and what they're going to do. Yeah, we don't yeah. control the disclosure of them. They control yeah. that. Exactly. Um, no government controls what they do. Um, but I don't think, that, you know, some people think, well, they're here to control us. Uh, no. No, they've done that already. It's called religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they've done that. Uh, they imposed uh, a religious uh, kind of uh, way of dealing with them way back when, when they instituted this institution called kingship over us so it's the selected certain humans to have kingship over us queenship and priest and priestess classes over us and isn't it amazing though that we saw the coronation of uh, king charles the third he held two things in his hand one is the orb which represents his earthly authority and the other is the scepter which re- represents divine authority it's the divine authority that is given to him, anointing him to have earthly authority. Mm. And that is symbolic of rituals that existed since the first leader of a cave group emerged out of the cave to lead the tribe. I I have rock. Yeah. (laughs) I have rock and I have stick. Basically, that is a recreation of that ritual. Right. Uh, And so there's kingship instituted. uh, There's king and queenship instituted. There's priests and priestesses instituted and the priest and priestess class was there to help humans understand the divine to interpret the divine and to ordain the earthly leader to lead his or her people Mm. and that was and if you go back into the sumerian text if if you read any of that um, it is said that the anunnaki instituted these things not only did they gave the sumerians technology Um, But they instituted these things a long time ago, and it's been that ever since. It used to be more matriarchal, and that doesn't mean women will rule the earth. I mean, uh, I said that in a previous interview I had, co-interview with Anjali Schultz, and I said uh, one of the things that might happen is a matriarchal society, and people interpret that immediately as saying, oh, John says that all women will rule the earth as Amazons or something. That is ridiculous. I'm saying matriarchal in the sense that Instead of having this adversarial, like, uh, mine is bigger than yours, which is very male-like, mm-hmm. uh, it's more coming from a place of compassion, that we'll look at each other as humans in a compassionate sense, as a loving sense, as a mother uh, nurtures a child and loves a child, that we'll have this relationship with each other, which is necessary for us to, we've got to get rid of all of these human, like, instituted biases and prejudices based on the way we look. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our national origin, our belief systems, um, how much money we have in the bank at all. Social that status. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's ridiculous. We see ourselves as humans that we have so much in common and we see them if they sh- appear and how much 
we don't have in common. You know, we will come together and they're not here to take us over. That's ridiculous. Um, they did that a long time ago by instituting human institutions, you know, to help us rule ourselves. And they've been here all the time to guide us, to keep us from blowing ourselves apart with nuclear weapons is one of the lessons that they taught us, you know. Right. Um, and I'm here to say that I hope one of the things that will be disclosed is that everything that happened at Maelstrom Air Force Base was real. That, yeah, they actually, you know, it's been mostly in anecdotes. You know, people say that this happened, but the government has never officially said, yeah, it happened. We know it happened. You know, we know these, these incidents have happened, and not only at our nuclear missile bases, but also uh, where we have the Department of Energy National Labs, which work on, like, nuclear technology, nuclear physics. These things happen, you know, at Los Alamos National Labs and all the national labs, they see the phenomenon. Uh, they need to admit that, you know, because our stewardship of the planet is very important to them as well as to us. Yeah. And they've been here, if they're here, as Gary Nolan says, they've been here a long time, folks. It's their planet and our planet, and they don't want us to blow up our planet, which is also their planet they live on. Yeah. So I think that's part of the lesson that they're trying to convey. It's as if chimpanzees developed science and then they start blowing each other up with nuclear bombs we would intervene we would be like wait 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 we live here too yeah. you guys can't do that it's a similar concept right yes, absolutely yes that, that's a good analogy thanks jason yeah, feel, feel free to use it yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> uh john it's a pleasure to talk with you sir it really is uh louis do you have any final questions for our guest today just a big thanks john uh, we really appreciate your time and again i know you're a busy guy you've done a lot of these shows you're very candid you answer honestly we appreciate that you didn't make us work work hard to get some goods <laughs> and our viewers will appreciate that as well. Uh, we're excited about the news that you've uh, alluded to that disclosure is coming. I think this is very positive and uh, we'd love to see you back again after disclosure. If that's uh, you're taking a bit of a rest and then coming back in, please uh, let's hit you the first time on your next tour. Not the second <laughs> last time. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Louie and Jason for having me uh, again. Uh, it's a, it's a privilege to be, um, on the uh, UAP studies podcast, uh, and especially since I know all your other guests are so much more well informed than I am, and uh, you I would belong say this, amongst them. You belong. Well, well, thank them. you. Yeah. I would say this after disclosure, um, there will probably be a lot more interesting people you would want to talk about other than me. They'll be coming forward that people your audience have never heard from. Bring it on! Coming Bring forward. it on! Absolutely. This is what this is for, right? Yeah. This, yeah, absolutely. So we'll get everyone in our viewer uh, world right now. Give us some comments. Let us know what your thoughts are. Again, if you have any questions for John on his next tour, send them our way. We'll be happy to send them off. And uh, if you do like our program, please like. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Makes a difference. Helps us out. It allows us to keep doing what we do and bring on these amazing uh, interviews. You learn something every time. I know we do. And every we know time. you guys do. So uh, we love you for it. Thanks for supporting the show. And thanks again, John. It was an absolute blast having you.